All right, I am going to open it up for audience questions. Uh, so if you have a question, raise your hand, um, and I will repeat the question before the panel gets to answer it. Any questions in the audience? What language is it to code for virtual reality? Annie. Um, so a lot of, well, our programs, I know there are different platforms, but we develop most of our programs like a video game, which um, there are great video game engines that you can use. So one is Unreal Engine, and the one we prefer is Unity. Um, we choose Unity just because it has a better physics aspects to it. Um, so, you know, you can make the wind blow, the gravity exactly how you want it to be. Um, Unreal Engine has been said that they have much, much better graphics, but then they're lacking in the actual um, program development aspect of that. So uh, there are you know, different ones you can choose from. Um, and then as far as the menus and actually doing that type of thing, um, we use C++, but um, I think there are different methods other people use. I'm not as much of a technical person as other people here. <laughs> Another question? QVR is $99 coming out. Is that a, is $99 for a headset plus the cost of the phone um, ready for prime time mass adoption at that price point? $99. All right, Annie wants to go. <laughs> to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as far as mass adoption for the mobile version, I think that anyone with a 2016 Samsung phone, um, since now the actual consumer version is coming out for every phone in that line for 2016, um, they should get one. Uh, just because it's a, it's, it's a very fun and novel thing. It's a very low price point for the addition. And if you're already going to have a phone, um, if you choose Android over iPhone, you're likely going to have a Samsung phone anyway. So as far as mobile, I'd say yes. Um, um, although the mobile applications are not as in-depth as the PC applications are going to be. Those are really, really great for 360 video. Um, I watched a presidential debate on mine earlier this week and I felt like I was actually on stage. So for those things, it's really cool. For live streaming, it's awesome. You can be at an event without being there, pay a fraction of the price to actually feel like you're at the Super Bowl, things like that. So. For people who are really into experiencing things firsthand, I think that is definitely a great price point for that. For PC VR, even Oculus has partnered with um, some of the biggest computer parts companies to create a high, high powered PC for under $1,000, which is really unheard of for that quality of a PC. And those are coming out next year as well. So as far as affordability, it's, it's ridiculous that you can get all of that for around $1,000 with any program you'd ever want to run, where a couple years ago it'd be like thirty dollars to $100,000. Audience I, question? Oh, oh, I wanted oh, you to, want to, let's make the panel interesting. So this is the problem though. The field of view is small and the resolution is low on head-mounted displays compared to what people think it's going to be. Uh, I have spent a lot of time putting, putting head mounts on people's heads. Back years ago, they would freak out, think that you know, it was going to radiate their brain or it was going to hurt their vision. <laughs> they still now, think that today. Now what happens is I put it on their head and they go, oh, I thought it was going to be like, better than that. Um, we saw this with Google Glass. I think we've probably seen this a little bit with Oculus. We'll see what happens with the HoloLens. You know, you see these really cool videos and then you put it on. There's some realities of the optics of head-mounted displays and the resolution of them that, um, I mean, I'm overjoyed. They look <laughs> great to me, but I'm saying this is part of the, prob the, the problem we've had with, with uh, uh, AR and VR is that expectations are up here and then, you know, the experience isn't quite uh, where people are expected. So you've got to manage expectations so that they don't, uh, you know, kind of get, turn their back on it. Margaret, are you the tiebreaker? I am so oh, not. No, I, I think I no no. It's not a tiebreaker. I think it's great. Like I think we're on. You know, I think AR and VR is finally going to become a thing. I'm just saying, the experience isn't quite maybe what some people are expecting. It, yeah, I can understand that, but um, I will say the DK2 that the one back there, the the graphics on that are only as good as the screen is. So as the screens improve, that's going to majorly improve because the graphics cards are ridiculous. Um, but the CV1, which is the next Oculus consumer version, it's like 10 times better than that one. So, and it's so lightweight, I just, I'm a fan. <laughs> My answer is Moore's Law. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, audience question? For, for internet performance uh, and multiple uh, players in a, in a game, uh, is internet an issue with VR? Annie. 
Yes. <laughs> um, is yeah. It acceptable? Is it has it? Is it what Mar what Mary Beth is saying? Like expectations are like, oh, I can't. I, I expect the internet to be better. I don't or know. are people kind of like, hey, it's okay. The majority of the people I know who have done those collaborative type things are really, really, really enthusiastic about VR or are developers themselves. So they're not the the consumer level people. So they're just you know making do with what's available. But if you don't have a really excellent hardline internet connection, there's always going to be that lag. Um, um, you have to have everything running to your, your head at 75 frames a second and the slower, like the worse that gets, the worse the experience is. So the internet definitely plays in that. <laughs> well, and it, you know, it's, that's one issue, but this lag and the latency, that's what causes simulator sickness. You know, so there's the issue of tracking your head. You know, so with VR, it's either trying to track position and or orientation. Uh, same thing with AR, but, um, you know, these tiny, tiny delays cause those uh, differences between what your inner ear thinks is happening and what you're seeing. And um, so things have to be super, super fast. When you talk about AR, you've got your eyes cicading. And um, so these are, yeah, it's very hard to make a head-mounted display that uh, pleases people. Yeah, but I think the frame rate and latency comes down to the computer most of the time and the programming. Um, mm -hmm. And yep. yeah, that's something just people are going to have to get used to. Well, but you also have tracker error too, you know. So yeah. depending on what uh, you're using for your orientation sensing and your position tracking, you're going to have delay and error. Uh, we have our next question from the back. How ready is all of this for the wireless world? <laughs> oh, it's ready. I'm just, I'm just trying to make the panel interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, like, um, I think we're at the dawning of the age of AR and VR. So on that note, what are your predictions for 2016? I'll start with Margaret. I think that hyper-reality, my word of the night, um, so that is the blending of AR and VR. I think contextuality, which means that you will have the information, that you, you have situational awareness with your mobile device, so it knows where you are, who you're interacting with, what equipment you're in front of, you know, in an industrial internet setting, and just-in-time reconstruction, which um, one of the big um, uh, obstacles with augmented reality is this idea of computer vision and tracking and you know being able to get the content that you want to look at just where you want to look at it and you know so we started off with these really odd looking marker things and um, not too far in the distant future we'll be able to have a Google map you know our Google Earth map basically of the world around us and we won't need these things to trigger augmented reality experiences anymore so my prediction is that um, hyper reality contextuality and just-in-time reconstruction are at the epicenter of a revolution that's going on with digital technology Annie predictions near near future knowing I'm gonna the, you know the follow-up question is gonna be you know long term okay, okay. near term um, yeah, near future for 2016 specifically, um, people are already calling it the year of VR mainly because of all the consumer headset releases. Um, we're going to see the Oculus consumer version, which I have tried and it's amazing. And also the HTC Vive, which we're very excited about because of the lighthouse technology that will allow such a bigger um, span of space that you can move around in. Um, it'll create different experiences. So I definitely see a lot of companies adopting that for marketing or marketing applications um, first and training applications and of course the obvious gaming but um, I think eventually we'll see it for more pra even more practical uses. Mary Beth? Uh, you know so we're, we've been talking about hardware and, and uh, kind of the low-level stuff but um, really the challenge is figuring out what kind of user experiences and what kind of applications are appropriate for this medium and uh, we always harken back to the web. You know, think of websites in 1995. They were incredibly simple. No one really knew what to do with the web. It's like, okay, there's a picture and a bio and I can go to cnn.com or like you would never imagine the web of today with websites from 20 years ago. And similarly, even though lots of people have been thinking about AR and VR for many years, we need to have this big renaissance of creators. You know, So with the web, you have every person on earth basically can make a website. Similarly, when you have all these crazy people from big companies to you know crazy artists and entrepreneurs uh, making content for this new medium, 
that's when we're going to we're going to realize what it really means. You know, the applications we come up with now are kind of like the obvious ones, and. Um, how VR and AR is being used 10 years from now, I think we would all, like if we saw a vision of that right now, we would be amazed and surprised. Before we get to long-term uh, predictions uh, for AR, VR, where's the money? How do we make money at this? Well, I have some thoughts there. <laughs> the adult <laughs> entertainment industry. If you're VR, <laughs> if I, if I, I was some, over here, I'd be doing. None I know of some that. people that do that. <laughs> and this is from the panel of ladies. <laughs> um, I would say for augmented reality, I thought Mary Beth, as always, had such a great point about the military. Um, and innovation happening there, especially with augmented reality. And if you look at the next step down from the military, we have industry. And um, so I truly believe, which is the focus of my business, that the industrial internet is the real money-making opportunity today for augmented reality. If you look at, you know, much to her point, um, you can force military workers to put on all this gear and you know one step down from that you can um, have GE employees or you know all of these industrial employees who have very very um, you know purposeful industrial occupations wear headsets and um, and and wear this equipment to deliver a really um, superior augmented reality experience. So, in my opinion, the real money-making opportunity today is in the industrial internet and the digital twin. Annie, where's the money? Um, yeah, well, the money right now is for us is for marketing applications. Um, we're seeing a lot of people just wanting to show, like, be be a peacock and show that they are ahead of the curve and they're using the latest technology so all these bigger companies are you know bringing these applications that people like us are creating to trade shows to pretty much get attention um, once everyone has this that's not going to work out as well um, so that's when I see the shift to more like training and practical applications but really I think training is going to definitely be where it is um, even with some of the industrial groups and also military where um, they're they're using this so that they don't have to be put in those dangerous situations but they can feel like they're really there. Um, that's really important and it's also going to eventually save money when they're able to, um, you know, instead of having a trainer go all over to these places, they can just send a headset. Um, so yeah, I think that's where it is. Mary Beth, I'm going to ask you a different question because you're not in it for the money, okay? You, you work at Georgia Tech. Yeah, clearly not. <laughs> so, so tell me, give me an example of how AR or VR is making the world a better place. What are you doing for society? Well, um, <laughs> oh no, well, the, uh, well, for years we've been using uh, AR and VR for um, humanitarian systems, for education. Uh, for example, we're about to do a, a project um, related to kind of computing for good where we are going to use like kind of an immersive VR experience to help people understand how their donations to a nonprofit are, you know, can help someone in the third world. And so I think there's a lot of value with AR and VR of kind of transporting you, putting you in the shoes, not just transporting you somewhere else, but putting you in the shoes of someone else and seeing through their eyes. And um, we're actually doing some experiments along those lines, like using these technologies for like conflict resolution, uh, like cultural sensitivity that you can, kind of not just see, but truly have this emotional and even physiological response of as though you're in walking in that person's shoes. Thank you. Oh, so we need to wrap it up. So last question. Uh, predictions for 2035, long term, AR contact lenses, cars, flying cars, hoverboards. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mary Beth, start us off. Uh, the futurists are always wrong and they look silly. I mean, I think, <clears throat> so I have no idea how we'll be using these technologies. I think what is for sure is that virtual content, we will, it will just be standard that that is it's part of our world, you know, that it's just with us. It's not, oh, let me access my device. It's just there. Now how, you know, and delivered through whatever mechanism. And uh, not only is the virtual stuff in the world with us, but 
the devices are just part of us. They're, uh, if we're talking about 2035, they're in our bodies. Um, and so there becomes this question of what is me and what is the device and can they be separated? Margaret? I mean, as always, I have to agree with Mary Beth. <laughs> Nobody has a better line of sight into the future than she does. Um, but I, w I mean, I would definitely concur that, um, you know, I in the short term that we can see ahead, we have companies like Apple buying companies like Matayo to be able to integrate this technology into um, the existing, you know, mobile browsers. So today we have to launch an app to be able to see this content. Um, in the not very distant future, we'll be able to just point our, you know, device through the browsers to be able to see content. I know you have something to say. I was there. Say, everyone go read Rainbow's End by Werner Vinge, <laughs> and that was the answer to this question. <laughs> it's what you were, you yes. were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So um, I think just this very seamless and transparent, you know, movement back and forth between the digital and the phys physical and, you know, that could come in form factors that we can't even imagine today. Annie, predictions, 2035. Yes. Ooh. Um, yeah, so as far as what Mary Beth said about the man and machine kind of coming together, I will definitely be a cyborg by then, and all of you will be too. Um, <laughs> or dead. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> hopefully the former. You make it to 2035. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, as, and I'm going to give a book plug too. Definitely read Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. Yeah, you know. Mm. Um, that's what I think it'll be like. There will be an oasis, and that's just a, you know, something that all of us are in this one VR mega program where you know you go to the store you go to see your friends you go to see the movies it's all going to be in in a place like that so that's my prediction totally read ready player one that's what 2035 will be like will we be able to eat whatever we want and not gain weight then Maybe. Yes. You'll gain weight, but no one will know. Yeah, you'll gain weight, and no one will ever have to know. You're just floating in a vat of jelly. What are you wearing that's going to make you feel better and your health better? Annie. Oh, well, yeah, well, well, I'm just, I'm really excited about haptic technology. So um, one of the things that we're really looking forward to is something called an omnidirectional treadmill, which will be pretty helpful when you're going through virtual reality worlds. Um, you can walk through in any direction and it'll pick it up. So um, as far as health programs or programs that are tricking you to be healthy, I think that's going to be a major key player. Definitely haptics like that. Margaret. A good backpack and a nice pair of shoes because you'll actually be outside doing something? <laughs> Very bad. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, I'm not wearing any, any technology right now because none of it provides enough value for me right at this moment. All right. I mean, I have contact lenses. You can call those wearable technology. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Annie. Thank you all. Thank you.